Hi, everybody. Stefan Molyneux from Freedom Main Radio. Hope you're doing well. Back with a good friend, Gerald Salente. He is the head of the Trends Research Institute and the publisher of the Trends Journal. He has earned a reputation as today's most trusted name in trends for accurate and timely forecasts. You can find his information at trendsresearch.com. Thanks so much for taking the time today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. So, Gerald, one thing I'm very concerned about in the modern economy as it stands is the bankers seem pretty happy. The bankers and the central bankers seem pretty happy. And when the bankers and the central bankers seem pretty happy, it usually means that Main Street is about to get hosed in some spectacular fashion. Um, what's going on with central banking, with interest rates, uh, with uh, shaky Chinese corporate debts that uh, can help people to plan for their economic future? Well, actually, this, the central bankers are one story, but right now the bankers are, don't like what the central bankers are doing with the negative interest rate policy because they can't make money in charging more interest rates to, to customers. So the banks, when you look at their profits, they're having a very difficult time. So it's not a good time for the banking industry. The central bankers are they're making up stuff as they go along. I mean, there should be outrage all over the world for a bunch of banks taking over the world economy. There's never been such a thing as negative interest rates in the history of the world, part one or part two. There's never been anything like a negative yield out of a bond. And now it's like 40% of them in, 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 uh, throughout the world are showing negative interest rates. This is unheard of. So the central bankers don't know what to do because they've kept they played their game with quantitative easing zero interest rate policy and it hasn't worked and the fact is it has not worked because if you look at the numbers here in the states the ussa 95 percent of the wealth created since 2009 has gone to the one percent that's a fact 51% of the population in this country is earning under $30,000 a year. That's a fact. The middle class is now a minority. That's a fact. The gap between the rich and the poor is the widest in the United States of any of the developing nations, the developed nations, I should say. That's a fact. The gap between the rich and the poor is the highest it's been since the Gilded Age. These are facts. So the central banks, what they did was they enriched the filthy rich. So the bankers are on one end, but the big hedge funds, all those mergers and acquisitions, $60 billion in stock buybacks a month, juicing up their equity prices, that's who it's helped. But right now they're in trouble because the, the, you have a lot of banks now that are not in favor of negative interest rates because they can't make any money. And again, Look at the banking indexes. You know, they're way off. They're, put, they're turning in lousy earnings. So it, it's, re it's reached a point, and it's the cover of our Trends Journal this month, and that is that the, uh, the central banks have, have, have lit the fuse of a global uh, economic time bomb. And it seems extraordinary to me that... Central banks almost have to pay people to take their money with these negative uh, interest rates. Uh, shows how valueless some of this money is becoming. And the fact that the money is floating up into an ever more complex series of Byzantium financial maneuvers as the stock buybacks, mergers and acquisitions and so on, it's not actually being invested into improvements in capital goods, into increasing worker productivity. So it doesn't seem to be building the foundation for future prosperity, but rather uh, threatening it. Well, again, look at the numbers and who are the richest. It's people that are producing nothing. And you look at the hedge funds, the private equity groups. The, you know, what is it now? 65 billionaire, 65 people have more money than half the world's population? I mean, we've never seen anything like this before. And you're right, they're not manufacturing anything. And it's, it's the same thing with, you know, the Internet world. They're not building anything. They're creating jobs. It's great, but what are they producing in hard items? Nothing. And so when you look at the wealth factor and the rest of the world, again, it's turned into slave landia. We've never had this kind of 
a, a, a gap between rich and poor ever in, in, in uh, modern history. It's a new, actually, it's a neo-feudal society, not only to the point of earnings, but to the point of laws. Look at all these, these the Wall Street white shoe boy gang. Look at the banks. Not one head rolled under that fraud in chief Obama. You know, he, I have to tell you, George Bush was the disgusting, murderous, SOB, ignorant piece of garbage that should have been brought up on war crime tribunal for lying us into war. Obama is a traitor to humanity. This lying SOB lied his way into office, promising us all of what he was going to do, and one of them bring the bankers and the criminals on Wall Street to justice, and he brings in that fraud of a little boy, Eric Holder. Hold this, Eric. Yeah, the guy that was the attorney general that now went back to the white shoe boy firm and is holding thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar dinners of meetings for Hillary Clinton. So nobody's head. This is a neo feudal society. The six banks convicted, convicted of felonies. Not one head rolls. So we're talking about the gap between the rich and the poor. It goes beyond just living. You better don't have more than two drinks when you get in that car. Look what they do with the TSA. Feeling people up, little kids. Cause stop the crap. This reminds me like when I was a kid in school and they used to have to hide, tell us to hide under the desks. We'd have an air raid drill. Yeah, like a, a bomb, an atom bomb would go off and because you're under the desk, you're going to be saved. And then when you got older, they put you up against the wall and your hands behind your head. These are the same jerks, the same stupid people that are doing TSA made up that kind of crap. So what I'm saying is there's different laws for we the little people. You think the hedge fund people and the politicians are flying, you know, like we do? They got their private jets. So this whole banking system has created a neo-feudal society and they want to do everything and they are doing everything to keep people in check. Well, as you as you pointed out in the recent Trends Journal, Draghi, uh, which is a, a perfectly malevolent name for the head of the European Central Bank, so the German critics are saying, look, negative interest rate policies, they hurt people who are saving money. Now, you don't want to hurt people who are saving money because they're allowing for the accumulation of capital that allows for expansion of the economy. It hurts people on fixed income. It hurts pensioners. It's harmful to the small banks because they rely, of course, on interest rates for profits. Life insurance companies, they guarantee minimum returns on investment. All of these people are being royally flogged by these negative interest rates. And Draghi said, we have a mandate to preserve price stability for the whole of the Eurozone, not only for Germany. We obey the law, not the politicians, because we are independent as stated by the law. The law that they wrote. The politicians are even somewhat theoretically accountable to the people, but these people are making up their own rules, and then we wonder why they keep winning the game. Well, what did I write in there? What was my line? I don't know if you could say it on the radio, on, t on, your, on your broadcast. You can. Yeah. I said, you know, who made up this bullshit? What is this, the 13th commandment? They're abiding by the law. What, when Moses came down, he dropped one of the commandments? I mean, they're making this crap up, and they do it with this level of arrogance. And you know what really gets me? There's not a man among them. You go face to face with one of these little boys and call them out. They won't know whether to pee or poop. Oh, help us. Oh, help me over here. Get him arrested. Yeah. There's not a man among them. And not only them, the same military madmen. They all talk tough. There's, and they're destroying the world, and the people don't have the courage to rise up against it. Instead, they argue, whose jerk is better than the other jerk? My low life isn't as bad as your low life. You know, it used to be a lesser of two evils that they used to elect. Now it's the bigger of two wankers. Draghi also pointed out, he said, with rare exceptions, monetary policy has been the only policy in the last four years to support growth. Now, that is a pretty terrifying 
statement uh, and, and, and fairly honest. But basically, they're saying that massive government bond buybacks, the injection of made up monopoly money into a pseudo economy is the only thing that has even propped up the pretense of growth, which is like saying, well, I'm a coke addict and coke is the only thing that's maintained any shred of happiness in me for the last four years. Well, what does that say about the state of Western economies? That's why we're bullish on gold and have been. And our forecast for gold is that it has to go well above the 1300 mark and hit 14. When gold goes to $1,400 an ounce and stabilizes above that, we believe we're going to see a shot to 2000. And again, we're talking about Draghi. <laughs> Should be Draghi Queen. Anyway, look what's going on in, um, in, uh, in China. All this stimulus they're shoving in there. The numbers keep coming out. They're weaker than expected. They're, they're, not, they're, they're dumping trillions of yuan into the system. They can't salvage it. They're doing everything they can. Negative interest rates in Japan, it's not working. It's not even bringing the yen down. And that's the other thing, by the way. They keep putting out this big lie out there that it's a currency war and that they're purposely devaluing their currencies so they could export more. Because the cheaper your currency is, the more you'll be able to export. To a certain degree, that's true. But not in a society, in a global economy, where exports are down globally over 14%. So people aren't buying stuff. So the whole thing about a devaluation, you know, that's a very small part of it. And again, they don't know what they're doing. They failed at everything. And not only do they not, I'm not just saying that as an empty phrase. When you go back and read the Fed minutes, and in this land of freedom and democracy, those little boys and girls over there hold back the Fed minutes for five years. And then they let them out. Because five years, everybody forgot what was going on back then. And you read those minutes, they didn't have a clue. Everything they said was wrong. And then they get up there with this level of arrogance and tell you what we're going to do next. They're like the military, those generals, and major, major screw-up. I'd like to use the other word that starts with an F. They always come out with new plans to build upon their other failures and they do it with all this crap on them. You're dressed up like they're still little Boy Scouts. And they're having nothing, not one victory to show for it, but plenty of murder. And they keep coming back with new solutions for failure, whether it's the military, whether it's the Fed, whether it's Washington, whether it's Downing Street, you name it, a bunch of little liars, losers, freaks, and frauds, and the people salute them, they stand up and cheer, they bow down and suck up their crap. And until the people stand up against what's going on to them, robbing them not only of their financial future, but of their dignity and respect as they feel them up and put it, I'm listening to this Jerk, this guy, Jeb, whatever his name is, Johnson, uh, the head of Homeland Security. Yeah, go to the airport a little earlier. Yeah, waste your damn life so a bunch of losers who, and they show what failures they are. You could sneak through with a lot of stuff. They run these tests all the time. Could degrade and humiliate you. And the people do it. And then again, look at the people. You ever go to the airports? Yeah. It's the flying circus. They say that pigs can't fly? Go look at them, man. They're loaded up over there. Look what the people have degraded themselves to. Look at the crap that they eat. Look at the garbage that they, 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 uh, they watch. The stuff that they listen to. Obama gave a speech at Howard University two weeks ago bragging. He said, you know, when I was a young guy in college, hip-hop and rap were counterculture. 
and now Shiona Rhymes, whatever her name is, and at, rules Thursday, and I'm not making this up, Beyonce runs the world. These are the words coming out of the President of the United States. Hey, the reason hip-hop and rap were counterculture is maybe because they're counter to culture. And when you're talking about because you're trying to make out there was racism that was keeping it down, maybe El Presidente is too stupid or short-sighted to remember there was a thing called jazz. And it was created by the blacks. And it had style and rhythm. Oh, and a couple of black cats, beginning with Jelly Roll Morton, Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald, Lionel Hampton, one after another, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, when music in, had, had instruments in them. And this clown of a boy, the liar in chief, throws out those little hate cards to get you riled up. Oh, maybe Obama forgot Motown too. Yeah, or the blues. <clears throat> so the other thing that I think is important for people to understand, and you can talk a little bit more about this, is the degree to which the central banking policies in Europe and North America are also exporting a huge amount of chaos around the world. Because as they create more money and the more, more money gets sucked into these derivatives and these financial machinations and aren't actually being used to improve the creation of goods and services for people, um, raw materials, which a lot of second and third world countries depend on for their uh, exports, the, the, the consumption or the demand for raw materials is going down. And as you point out in the journal, Nigeria, Venezuela, Brazil, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, you name it, well, the quantity and prices for their raw materials is, is declining. Production is declining. Factories are closing. Jobs are being lost. And then governments, of course, rather than cut their spending, raise their taxes to cover the losses. <laughs> And you can see, of course, this happening around the world, this increase in civil unrest, political strife. Uh, it has significant ripple effects all around the world where people's lives literally hang in the balance. Yeah, well, when all else fails, they take you to war. Mm -hmm. Look what's going on in Europe. Why the refugees leaving Syria? I can't figure it out. Couldn't because the United States and its coalition of the killing are bombing that place and supplying the arms to do it. I wonder why people are leaving Iraq. I haven't been able to figure that out. Maybe we should put together a blue ribbon committee. Could be because the United States and NATO and its coalition of the killing killed over a million people there and in Afghanistan. And now they're in Somalia and Sudan and Yemen supporting that war. The people have done nothing. Civilians are the ones that pay. So now you have the refugee crisis and now the migrant crisis, what you were talking about, what's going on in Nigeria, Congo, South Africa, Ghana, you name the country, if they're resource rich, now they're poor. So the people is flooding out of there as well. So you can see this, you can, and you can see what the political implications are. Look what happened in Austria with the Freedom Party. For the first time since World War II, a new party in there, Chancellor resigns. Look what's going on over there in, in Germany, with the alternative uh, for Germany, the AFD party. Look what's going on with Le Pen. And, and the Brexit over in, in the UK. So what's happening is you're seeing an, in Podemos party to some extent in, 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 uh, in Spain. But again, Podemos, as I read a lot into them, you know, they kind of sell out at different levels. But nonetheless, there's new movements. Take a look at the new movements in the United States. How about zero? How about mm. nada? Nothing. So again, what you're seeing is a total dislocation because of an economic collapse that's only been held up by them pumping in, as you mentioned it before, you know, this, this cocaine, monetary cocaine, and they're addicted to it. So when the addiction, you know, the patient eventually dies from an overdose, and that's what's going on with negative interest rates. It's an overdose of this, this, this fake uh, stimulant, it's a, and it's a killer. And it's to us, by the way, people say, what are the solutions? Self-sustaining economies. And you, the, all the, everything is being done to build up the multinationals and the biggest. 
so they could make more money. That's globalization. We're a country here in the States, what, 315, 320 million people? I mean, we have enough here to take care of ourselves. We, we can't make our own shirts, shoes, computers. We're too stupid. We should be doing, we should be trading with ourselves. And that's why, by the way, you're seeing Russia not having the type of internal turmoil. And now people are going to say, oh, that's because they put down the unrest. Yeah, like they don't do it over here. You go try, go try protesting like they arrested all those people in Washington that didn't make the news. No, the, one of the reasons it's happening in Russia is because they're reacting to the sanctions that were put upon them by Obama and the, and the flunkies following at them, him. And they're becoming more self-sustaining. So it's to become a so it's not only buying local, it's building nationally. It's a pride in heritage and a support of your country. So if neighbors are trading with neighbors, doing business with each other, that's the only way out. But they keep bringing the big lie of globalization so the DuPonts could merge with the Dows and, the, and this one could merge with that one and put everybody else out of business. When you have a self-sustaining economy, then you have more localized businesses and regional businesses. So to us, that's the way out. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to push back a little when you say there's not a big, strong movement in the U.S. Certainly, it remains confined within the bichromatic rainbow of the traditional Democrat-Republican party structure. But given the people who are floating up uh, as a result of a pretty strong horror at the existing system, you know, on the Democrats, you've got Bernie Sanders, who remains, you know, dazed and staggered, but still in the race. And on the Republican side, of course, Donald Trump, I think there is a lot of frustration. Now, there's no particular room for a new party to grow, given the way that American politi political laws work. But I think there is a lot of frustration and people are turning to non-traditional candidates, even within the United States. Yes, they're turning to non-traditional candidates, but there's not a movement. And there can be a third party. You know, one of the ways I made my name was when it, one of my books called Trend Tracking. Far better than Megatrends, Time Magazine, back in the 80s. And I predicted a new third party. And for some reason, I mentioned Ross Perot's name. Ross Perot had a real shot at it. People forgot, though, what happened. He dropped out of the race all summer long. Reason he dropped out, he said, was because of his daughter's wedding. You know, it became a whole fiasco. But he still got nearly 20% of the votes, even by a major screw up. No, there's, you're right, there's the frustration there, but there's not a solidified movement in a new direction. And that's where the failure, as I see it, is. Now, I come up. I think, as, as you do, from a fairly libertarian background. And one of the things that I was always taught was, you know, tariffs are monstrously bad. Now, I've been looking a little bit more into this. I wanted to get your thoughts on it, Gerald, that um, if you can replace income taxes with tariffs, uh, or and if, you're, if your overall tax burden can be lower, but if you can displace some income tax into tariffs, it's not that terrible an argument in some ways, in that tariffs remain optional, in that you can avoid the foreign goods, whereas the income tax remains, to most people, largely non-optional. Um, what do you think of the proposals? Since you talk about sort of um, uh, raising domestic demand, uh, what do you think about tariffs and their relationship to a self-sustainable economy? Absolutely. You go back, put in place what worked before. Before Bill Clinton put NAFTA in, put back what was there before. For the World Trade Organization, put back what was there before. And I'm not a label on anything. I don't call myself a... I guess if I were to categorize myself, I call it a progressive libertarian because I believe in laws. You know, you have stop signs and red lights, you know. And so to me, put back in place the Sherman Antitrust Act, the robinson patman Act, you know, the Clayton Antitrust Act. So the bigs didn't gobble up everything. So, again, and I agree with the tariffs, of course. You're using slave labor, dumping your product in here, and pulling out your money. Now, get, get lost. Go back home. We have a country to take care of. And I, I don't agree with it. Income, federal income tax is a sham. Another, you know, you, you know my six words that killed America. Harvard, Princeton, Yale, bullets, bombs, and banks. Every, every one of these clowns are all Harvard, Princeton, Yale flunkies. 
They're a club. And the lowest of the low lives, well, I shouldn't say that, <clears throat> among the lowest of the low lives was Woodrow Wilson, president of Princeton. Gets elected on the promise he's not going to bring us into World War I, the most unnecessary war other than the other wars that followed. Lies his way into office again, and then gives us the federal income tax and the Federal Reserve. And of course, the income tax was helped to pay for the war machine. So we don't need this income tax because all it's doing is putting a federal government to watch over all of us so they can keep us in place. So, you know, I agree with you. We need tariffs. We need to go back to what worked before. If your life was going on better and then you changed it in decline, wouldn't you want to think back and say, hey, when was I doing better? What was I doing different? So the, everything's there. You don't need a Dodd-Frank bill. <clears throat> Just put back Glass-Steagall that Bill Clinton killed. I uh, mean, Canada <clears throat> didn't have those things and didn't go through the same thing. I think that the major issue, and, and this is where the, the sort of blood-soaked fiat currency analogy really needs to be sort of pounded into people's heads, the degree to which the welfare state, which creates this sycophantic dependence on government and people on welfare will almost always vote for um, more government because that's the source of their revenue. The, the welfare state and the warfare state together can't be co-joined without the illusion of debt and fiat currency. I mean, if you have some sort of limited currency, whether it's gold-backed or commodity basket-backed, you just can't create stuff out of thin air. And I don't think it's any accident that in the 60s, when America wanted to pursue both the welfare state and the war in Vietnam, that that led to the final decoupling of gold and dollars under Nixon. Uh, the degree to which evil becomes invisible because it's funded through money printing and debt uh, is one of the things that uh, is hard for people to see because when it manifests itself, it's usually at such a late stage of disaster that it seems almost I irreversible. You, you nailed it. I agree with you 100%. You know, I told you the story about Ross Perot and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Ross Perot and how I forecast that. John Connolly, you mentioned getting off the gold standard. He, of course, was the governor of Texas that took the bullet in the back sitting in front of Kennedy. And he was uh, Nixon's, as a Republican, the Treasury Secretary. I have a photograph of me and um, uh, John Connolly and in front of the book depository with him and his wife. He wanted to see me to find out, wanted to meet me, how I, how I knew about the, um, that there'd be a new third party two weeks before the election in 1992. I write about this in the Trends Journals in the past. And as we're walking back into the Anatole Hotel, he said to me, remember, this is their first time back since the assassination. I have the photo of the, uh, Ryan, would you get that photo over there on the wall over there? The, um, uh, we're walking back into the Anatole Hotel and he said to me, you know, Gerald, he said, I, I love your book, Trends uh, Trend Tracking. He said, it's a fine piece of work. And um, I know your heart's in the right place. He said, but you don't have a clue what's going on. And neither do the American people. Because if they did, there'd be a revolution in this country. Now, this is going back to 1992. And this is the guy that was the Treasury Secretary that took us off the gold standard. Ryan, it's all the way on the right over there. Over to the right. All the way against the wall over here to the right. Uh, Go ahead. Anyway, the, the corruption is endemic. It's been going on a long time. So remember, this is their first time back since the assassination. And he's telling me, how corrupt everything is. And here's the guy that deregulated, that was partially responsible for taking us off the gold standard. Right. When the economy gets bad for the average person, there's usually been strong indicators ahead of time, particularly, you know, business, real estate, business to business markets and so on. And that's something that I kind of want to raise people's awareness of. I'm just going to quote from the Trends Journal here you wrote, on the commercial side, sales of offices, apartments, blocks, 
Hotels and other commercial buildings registered their sharpest fall since the panic of 08, plummeting 46% in February, according to Real Capital Analytics. What movements, what dominoes are going on in the business-to-business or business real estate market that people really, really need to get their uh, uh, eyeballs on? Well, in the, in the hot areas, they've been way overbuilt. So whether it's in a Toronto or Montreal or Calgary or New York or uh, New York City or San Francisco, London, you know, the hot spots around the world are overdeveloped and there's going to be a big pullback. Does that mean it's going to stay down forever? No. But the people that bought at the top are going to get hit at the bottom because they're going to lose jobs. And that's when it starts unraveling big time, when the jobs start going. So first the real estate collapses, and then the jobs go after that. And that brings the markets down even more. So I would suggest it's a very cautious time to invest in real estate because I believe we've peaked and we're going down from here. There will be still hot spots. And that doesn't mean the hot spots are going to turn ice cold, but they're going to cool down. And so I believe it's really a time. And again, here in, the, in New York City, you know, the, uh, the things are flat. The, the market's flattened out. There's no question about it. And, um, and you get, again, who could afford it? You know, you, who could afford, you know, a million and a half dollars for an apartment that used to cost, and I'm not exaggerating, you know, 85,000 20 years ago. So, you know, it didn't, you know, increase that much in value because of the real value of it. It's, it's supply and demand. And now that demand is going to go down for another reason as well. Where's all this hot money flowing out of? It's coming out of China, out of Russia, out of the Arab nations going into these bigger cities. That's going to slow down as well as we are in the commodity crisis. And again, oil prices are going up temporarily, but, you know, it's because there's supply, uh, there, there's uh, 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 breakdowns in systems, whether it's in Nigeria, Venezuela, what happened in Canada. So it, this is only temporary. But on the longer term, oil prices are going to continue to stay low until demand picks up. And demand's not going to pick up until the global economy picks up. And there's nothing to pick up the global economy. So... The real estate sector, as we see it, in the higher end particularly, is going to crash first, and the fish rots in the head down. So as the top goes, everything else falls out from under it. Well, and of course, if uh, there isn't a huge amount of Chinese currency flowing into the uh, real estate market in North America, this is particularly true uh, on the west coast of Canada. I mean, it's going to cause a drop there as well. And I think what people need to understand about the economy is that it's barely hanging on while debt is exploding. I mean, it is truly astonishing when you think that from the founding of America to the beginning of Obama's reign, uh, it took that long to get from zero to $10 trillion in debt. And then it only took eight years to go from 20, uh, from 10 to close to 20 trillions of dollars in debt. And the economy is barely, barely struggling along when you've got a zero interest rate policy from the Fed. <clears throat> and every time they try and jump it up a little, the um, stock market craters, the too big to fail bank bailouts, $700 billion pumped into banks in the troubled asset relief program. Uh, Barack Obama has dumped uh, almost a trillion dollars in this American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. <clears throat> so it's sort of like you have to get when you're blowing into a balloon and it doesn't inflate. It's because there are so many holes in it, you're just breathing into air. You know, another point, you're right. Now what you're hearing from these experts is now, you know, that was all monetary, mostly monetary stimulus. Now we need more fiscal stimulus. Let's get those jobs growing again so they can give their buddies money to build junk. Look at the subway system in, 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 in the nation's capital. The damn thing was only built in 1976 and it's falling apart. So the country's turned to crap. And so now what they're saying is now more fiscal stimulus. Again, more tax on the people, more robbing us of our future, more money for the elite. Let's um, <clears throat> continue our world tour and drop off in the uh, eternal zombie uh, economy of Japan. Uh, Japan, what is it now in its third decade uh, since uh, its original uh, crash where it's attempted to use uh, quantitative easing to try and get its economy back and uh, starting and recently uh, 
Japanese um, executive uh, confirmed that the bank's quantitative and qualitative monetary easing with a negative interest rate policy would continue in combination with continued large-scale purchases of Japanese government bonds. Uh, this kind of dealing of the wild cocaine of fiat currency into an economy that has now for, I guess, two or three decades maintained this really anemic limping pace and, and people's lives are put on hold. Japan's birth rate is one of the lowest uh, in the world and you have an aging population. This demographic time bomb, which I think has been facilitated by this uh, easy money policies and low interest rates, seems to be almost like a sort of Damocles that doesn't just hang over this eco economic quarter or the next recession, but over the fundamental viability and sustainability of entire cultures. You're right. You know, there's nothing to add. They don't know what they're doing. They've tried everything and it's not working. Abenomics, when they begin that, 2012, trillions of yen pumped into the system, hasn't done anything. Still in recession, I believe. If they're not, they're floating in and out of it. Oh, and then the other thing is, too, where do a lot of Japan's exports go to? A place called China. Hey, how about that place, South Korea, where their exports go to? Oh, China. How about most of Asia? Yeah, they go into China. Oh, and China's exports are down, huh? Imports are down. And exports, actually. But imports are down, like, what, over 20% on average. So now you have these countries that rely on China to buy stuff, and they're not buying it. And then again, you know, you have a global slowdown. So again, and then now let's go back to what I was saying before about these arrogant military morons. Military morons. I don't salute the troops. It ain't my trip. You want to go join and fight? Go. I'm not for it. That's why I held Occupy Peace. Now the military morons and El Presidente. And by the way, I'm sick of this guy talking down to us and calling us folks all the time. Folk you. <laughs> I've had it with this. No, I, I'm with you on that one. Crap. It's a horrible phrase. Yes, yeah, it's just to talk down to you. Yeah. To make I you mean, look do, like do a little I need a little piece of straw there. coming out of my mouth and uh, do 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 do. Hey, folks. Anyway. How about that pivot to Asia? We're talking about Japan. How about Japan just changing its constitution because they were never supposed to, after World War II, become involved in foreign aggression? They changed their constitution. Now the pivot to Asia. Every week, you saw what happened. The United States just sent a destroyer within 12 miles of one of those Chinese islands. The Chinese have no right to that island. Some sh jerk over here, asshole Carter, the, uh, the Secretary of Defense, another little boy. Can you imagine that guy in a fight? Can you imagine asshole in a fight? Something like and that. And he talks tough, our Defense Secretary. He couldn't defend himself. Maybe against Bruce Jenner he could, possibly, but we should put that on pay-per-view. It would be a big one. Now the United States sends ships right into the China's within a 12-mile limit. United States now putting bases back in the Philippines. Go back to Japan. You can see the war aggression building. When all else fails, they take you to war. And that's what they're doing. Look at the United States with the fleets now in the Baltic Sea. And then the American press comes out and said, you know, a Japanese, a, a, a Russian plane did barrel rolls within 50 feet of a, of an American destroyer or whatever the ship was. Where was the ship? Oh, 40 miles off the coast of a naval base? A Russian naval base? What if a Russian fleet was 40 miles off Virginia? Newport News over there. Newport Beach. You think they'd be Oh, they'd be applauding that the Russian fleet is out there? They'd probably bomb the damn thing. So you can see America's aggression with this passive, aggressive war hawk, Obama. And now he's going around the world trying to clean up his act. See, a legacy. Who gives a crap when you're dead? The legacy. It only counts when you're alive. How about that war in Libya? 
How about bringing troops back in the ground in Syria and Iraq? How about ending the war in Afghanistan that he lied, never did? And now it's the pivot to Asia. They just put missile defense systems in Romania. Now they're putting him in, into Poland. You can see where it's going. Neocons, they're con men. And Obama's one of them, and he plays in a different suit. He has the suit of arrogance. Uh, this, you know, there's an old saying that science is founded upon skepticism of the legitimacy of authority. In other words, don't let people tell you the way the world runs. Experiment and find out for yourself. And I think all freedom must be based upon skepticism of the wisdom of the rulers. Because oh. the, the 20th century is this big picture monstrosity of, oh, we're going to fight to make the world safe for democracy, says the um, First World War. And what results is communism taking over a third of the world and causing the deaths of over a hundred million people. And don't worry, we're going to have peace in our time, uh, says Chamberlain in uh, the 1930s. And then you end up with a war that kills 60 to 70 million people. And then America's hegemony is going to create peace and stability throughout the world. And then we're going to go into these Middle Eastern countries and we're going to export democracy and we're going to overthrow their rulers and we're going to set their people free. And instead of making the Middle East even remotely stable, all they've done is destroyed the Middle East and now are in the process of destabilizing Europe. At some point, dear God, can we ever at some point recognize that these people not only don't know what they're doing, but may in fact be unholy sadists un intent on undoing all of the civilizing aspects of the last few thousand years in the world. They're megalomaniacs, they're psychopaths and sociopaths. Listen to their words and watch their actions. They should be in mental institutions. Instead, they're running the world. And again, we're doing, well, we're doing what we can. That's why we launched Occupy Peace here in Colonial Kingston last September. We had Ralph Nader, Cindy Sheehan, Dr. Robert Thurman, Gary Null. And we have a, this isn't, you know, about oming and praying for peace. This is about an action plan for peace. To honor the founding fathers, beginning with Washington. A real commander in chief, not these little boys that shoot pool, play basketball, drive pickup trucks, and love to play golf. This is a guy that fought, a warrior. His farewell address, no foreign entanglements. And the world was at war big time back then. And again, look at Eisenhower, a real man, a general, five star general, supreme commander of the Allied forces. His farewell address that the military industrial complex is robbing the nation of the genius of the scientists, the sweat of the laborers, and the future of the children. So real men don't want real war. Only sick people do. And people, they don't send their kids to go fight. They don't fight. There's not a warrior among them. Oh, I got one. I forgot. Halan. No, maybe Cameron. Yeah. Look well, at it. Look at it. Yeah, when Cameron does not stick in his penis in a dead pig's mouth, right? Okay, you got to explain that reference because I read that the other day and uh, it, it took a lot of scotch to get that image out of my head. <laughs> well, it, when he was, you know, it, it, that, uh, those elite schools that they go to, you know, those, those Eatons and, and, and Ox, Ox, uh, Oxford. Oxford, yeah. You know, at their, their uh, fraternity. That's part of their, what they do. You know, they do all these weird things. And one of them was to stick his penis in the dead pig's mouth. I wonder who had sex with the pig. You know, I mean, look at them. Look I wonder at if that's going to end up on a stamp in England, you know, just that picture, um, if anybody ever used it anymore. Um, so this, the fact I think one of the big problems is, and we can perhaps close on, on your comments on this, it is, it is true historically that when governments can no longer bribe their populations, they don't tell them the truth, but rather they drag them to war. Because populations, tragically, are usually willing to accept a reduction in a standard of living for a war, but not for the avoidance of war. And America, as is all Western countries, kind of out of money. They're out of money to pay for welfare. They're out of money for the military-industrial complex. They're out of money for the big government unions. They're out of money for pensions. They're out of money for Social Security and health care and you name it. The unfunded liabilities are going, what, $150, $170 trillion? It doesn't matter. It might as well be Googleplex infinity dollars. So they're out of money. And unless there's a politician who's going to come along and say to people, look, we lied to you and you were greedy. We're kind of both at fault. 
we're out of money, we need to restructure, and it's going to be tough. And now the restructuring could be done in six to 12 months. The market is incredibly flexible at, at fixing problems. And as I've mentioned on this show before, there was a stock market crash in 1920 that was even worse than the stock market crash in 1929. But rather than it resulting in 13 years of depression culminating in a worldwide war, the stock market crash of 1920 resolved within 10 to 18 months because they just let the market take its course. We are six to 12 months away from a sustainable restructuring of the economy, but it would require not only that there's a politician out there willing to tell the truth to the Western populations, but also Western populations that might even be remotely inclined to listen. Well, again, you know, they, they, they boost up the markets because the big guys don't want to lose, so we have to bail them out. And, and on the, on the, uh, you know, the overall issue of the economy, you're, I, you know, it, it has to take its natural course. But going back to what you were saying about the war, when all else fails, they take you to war. And you were mentioning World War I. I mean, look at the French, what is it, uh, Sykes-Picot, the French and the English, carving up the Ottoman Empire, inventing countries that never existed before, and putting in dictators to rule them. Oh, we got the king of Saudi Arabia. Oh, yeah. Uh, 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 a princess kissed a frog, and the frog became a king? I mean, come on. They're dictatorships. And sykes Pico, they, they invented these countries. And then the, the, the bombings and the ruination and the destruction continues. Just different people with different names in different places. So, to me... You know, the, what no one wants to talk about is peace. And with peace comes prosperity. But more than that, it also brings about creating beauty and joy. You go back, I was mentioning jazz earlier on. The hottest, happiest music that this country has ever known was swing time. Mm. And then you look at the developments of the Art Deco. It was during a period of peace. And now you listen to what's going on now. And listen to the lyrics, listen to the music, listen to the beat. There is none. It's one beat. And what I'm saying is that with peace comes more than, you know, the throwaway line of prosperity. It brings, pro it brings a development of the human spirit at a higher level. And that's what's beyond the mentality of these people. I mean, you know, I look, what, Hillary Clinton's, what, addicted to Diet Coke? I watch Trump drink, you know, Diet Cola out of a plastic glass. They're cafons. Who would drink this stuff? It's destroying your brain. There's no beauty in it. They don't know beauty. I mean, what kind of man? Trump and I are the same age. If I came on here, with a stupid wig on and, and makeup all over my face and said, so who is this guy? Yet they get away with it. So what I'm saying is we need peace. You know, there's a thing called Christmas. There's another one called Easter. They never celebrate them for the Prince of Peace. All they talk about is retail sales and, and, uh, you know, Kids going away on vacation, you know, spring break. Nobody talks about, if you're going to talk about, you know, your religion, whatever it is, isn't there a peaceful element to the deity that you believe in? So again, everything I believe can be solved in a, in a climate that creates joy and beauty. And to me, that's what's missing. There was a thing called the Renaissance. If anybody needs any more proof, just look at what beauty created. And now it's a lack of beauty. Look at the buildings they put up. Ugly glass crap. Steel and glass. Oh, yeah, this one has more angles than the other one. Look at the style of the people, the way they dress anymore. Look at, as I said, go to the airport. It's, it's a flying circus. There's no, there's no, uh, there, ah. One final thought on Obama. I mentioned to you his speech, commencement speech at, at um, Howard University. 
To paraphrase what he said, but this is the, the true phrase of the, within the paraphrase, he said to the students that they should not hold on to, quote, moral purity, end quote, because if they do, quote, they won't get what they want. They won't win. So in other words, he's telling them to sell out. Moral purity doesn't count. Those are his words. Moral purity, if you hold on to it, you're not going to win. So winning is everything in the mind of a narcissistic, sociopath, psychopath. Because he's killed a lot of people with his, I'm really good at killing people line that he's never denied. It was written in a book about his Terror Tuesdays and how they're going to send drones to kill other people. So well, if he's, he's going to if he's going to push back against moral purity, I assume he's opening up the avenue for uh, Hillary Clinton to try and make her bid to get back into the White House. Because I think it's fair to say that if you are even remotely concerned with moral purity or moral standards of any kind, you might have some significant questions uh, for the former first lady. Exactly. So here he's telling students, young people graduating, let go of moral purity you'll win. So what I'm saying to you and going back and summarizing everything we said, the only way I see positive change here is, you know, art is the way of finding, to me, and again, our motto is think for yourself, for me, art is the way of finding the true meaning of the human spirit. And again, there's no greater example than the Renaissance and anybody that's traveled and sees the beauty that it was, that was created back then, compare it to now. So that's what's missing morality. And we have a president that says moral purity doesn't count. Winning does. So I can see a future where if we start with morality, the beauty and joy and peace will follow. Very well said, and I'm not going to try and add anything to that noble sentiment. Thanks again, Gerald. Always a great pleasure to chat. I just remind people to go to trendsresearch.com, sign up for the um, the Trends Journal, a very worthwhile publication. Thank you, of course, for everything uh, that you're doing to help promote clear thinking and uh, freedom in the world. And I'm sure we can talk again soon. Thank you so much. Take care.